because we hear clearly from our members that they're constrained under the current affordable housing settings, that they're looking at other tools that would be available to them to address the housing needs that, uh, that present themselves. And we've heard that directly through research that we've done, through meetings with members. And, and so that's one of the primary reasons. Uh, the second is uh, working with councils and engaging with councils around local housing need. Uh, we hear the same thing from, from territorial local authorities that they see increasing housing needs in their communities and they're looking at new tools in order to respond. Many of them are aware of the uh, Queenstown Lakes District Council and what they've done and how they've been able to use a planning tool to bring a pipeline of supply. And as they dig into it, they kind of get a bit scared when they start hearing about the lack of a legal framework, uh, some of the legal costs and time that were in, was involved in that. And so they're, they're looking at, at other tools, this being one of them. And also because we at Community Housing Ontario have direct experience with this. Our CE, uh, Scott Figginshow, who wishes he was here today, he was actually within a few hundred meters uh, going down to his managed isolation facility. He said, uh, just returned this morning from the US. He had a, a death in the family unexpectedly back in October. And so he was just arrived back. But Scott was, uh, was a planner with Queenstown Lakes District Council when their, uh, their response was formed and worked with them through that process. And as you can tell, I'm also uh, one who's an immigrant to New Zealand. I come out of California. And in my work experience there, I advocated for and directly helped to draft and implement uh, several inclusionary zoning programs in different cities and counties in, in California. And then also as a developer, I, I worked in 10 years in affordable housing development before I went to purgatory and asset management. Um, <laughs> those, those who oversee properties get that joke. Um, <laughs> All those decisions that seemed so right at the time as a developer, um, but uh, but then also worked under those programs and had to work through with private developers as the not-for-profit partner in those and really understood what are their drivers and how to make these things work. Because one of the things that that needs to be at the front of your mind around inclusionary zoning, it requires private development. It requires private developers to be bringing other product to market. And if you don't have that, there will be no affordable development. And so it's very important as you're looking at how you structure these things to keep that in front of your mind. Um, why did we do the discussion document? Well, it, it really is, again, this long-term interest that we've had in looking at inclusionary zoning, developing new tools for affordable housing, you know, we've released other papers. We uh, released a, a funding options paper about three or four months ago. So it's one of many activities that we've been engaged in. And we've uh, both alongside David had produced a paper, a, a think piece a couple of years ago for us. Uh, and so it's an ongoing uh, work stream for us. And what we see is an opportunity to change the system settings to enable more affordable housing. And really we wanted to foster uh, discussion and debate we know a lot of people have heard of this as they go digging, they're trying to find a sample policy or something, and, and it's somewhat illusory. You, you, you see a lot of information out there when you do a Google search, and some of it's contradictory, uh, some of it's confusing. Uh, because of the lack of, of local good examples, it's hard sometimes to understand why is it that the US does it a certain way, or the UK, or South Africa. and so. What we know is we'll need a New Zealand way to do this if we're going to do it. And so we wanted to, to open that up. Uh, we had no idea that RMA reform would, would uh, kick in so quickly after that. And that's why we wanted to get it. We now see an opportunity that wasn't present before as we have been discussing this over the last six, eight months. It was, you know, maybe we can get a statement into the, the national policy statement or the, or the government policy statement on affordable housing. Yeah, that'd be nice. but doesn't really address the fact that it still doesn't put it into legislation. And so this opportunity that has arisen with the commitment of the government to open up the RMA, potentially come out, it sounds like with two different acts, it gives us that opportunity to put this forward and to put a legal structure around it that's been missing to date. Um, what do we want today? Basically a good discussion. Uh, 
views are across the board on this and, and there are legitimate concerns about inclusionary, the impacts it can have. If it's done poorly, it is worse than not doing it at all in many respects. Um, and, and we think it's just important that people are able to raise their ideas, their concerns, their questions, um, how they think it can help and, and what they would like to see in a program that comes out of it. And through that discussion, we hope to you know, just increase our overall understanding of the possibilities and also the potential roadblocks. And one of the things, and I uh, just wanted to acknowledge Tanya Perez is in, in the room with us, Tanya uh, was commissioned to, to prepare the work for us. And so thank you, Tanya. I think it's done a good job uh, in the feedback we've had is that it has uh, stirred the debate, but you know, a nice table, you know, there's a lot of things to think about through this. And this is kind of a starter for 10. Uh, you know, is it mandatory or voluntary? Who's going to deliver it? What's the definition of affordable? Is it going to be retained? How do we incentivize or our offsets? So lots of things to think through. Uh, more questions and answers at this point, but that's fine. We're at the start of this discussion. And hopefully with the rest of the speakers this morning and uh, the input from the audience, we'll all come out of it with a bit, uh, a bit clearer idea of, of what it is and what it isn't, and then continue the discussion in the new year. So thank you very much for your time. If there are any questions, uh, happy to take those at this point, but if not, uh, I'll turn it over to Ben Al. Everybody in the right room? <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you all. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm from uh, Ocean City, New Zealand. I'm a principal advisor and primarily working on three waters on now moving into spatial planning and arm reform and um, uh, housing, primarily housing affordability. So, my background is I started with Treasury with the housing team. Worked on the UGA, um, so the Urban Growth Agenda, housing affordability. Was involved in at the time of the creation, like the thinking through of a nascent kind of emerging intervention logic for housing affordability there at the time. Um, uh, then I moved to. I, I was actually involved in setting up HUD, so Housing and Development uh, Ministry, and then moved to the Ministry, uh, and there continued on with uh, working on the Urban Growth Agenda primarily. Um, okay, so I shifted then to local government in Zealand primarily because I got interested in the political economy problem and institutions and incentives as part of the problem of housing affordability. Um, okay, so that, that's my background. Um, so today I'm basically presenting to you just some exploratory thinking. So I had to put this together the last two days. So I was told that I did the presentation. So I thought I was coming to a discussion, so a workshop kind of to the table where we're going to have a conversation. Um, so this is just sort of highly thinking of how I'm working through the prospect of setting up a work program, or a work program, a working group, or like yeah, a policy program around inclusion resigning. So my thinking is uh, drawing a lot of material together from my time in the Treasury at HUD and some of my strategic outlook on it. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details of whether it's voluntary or not, but it's going to be more placed in well, where are we at with government intervention housing at the moment? Um, what what we need to think about, what kind of framework might the working group, well, not necessarily what framework, but that a framework might be required to think through it. And I'll give you some examples of why it might be needed. Okay, um, to jump a bit. So the remit itself, so uh, at the end of general meeting at the local government New Zealand, um, a remit was passed, and this is basically, I'm quoting it now, to um, advocate to central, or to government basically, um, to work on or to, to think through or to establish a legislation that and it says fully enables councils to just housing for a bit. I think that's what I said. Um, um, and to establish a working group to work on this on, on affordable housing with um, a specific mention of some agencies to get involved and also to advocate for a national policy statement. So that's what I was asked, what I'm being asked to do. Yeah, so I'm going to work through you how I'm thinking uh, through this because I think it's um, uh, ambitious and yeah. Uh, okay, so. Uh, it's, it's like, if you look back, there are two mentions, it's housing affordability and affordable housing. So uh, in my work through, across the Treasury and HUD, uh, there's still debate. So at HUD, I think my understanding is that HUD is still divided on what actually housing affordability means itself. Um, but we might, um, and also across the public sector, like Treasury and HUD won't agree on what that means. Um, and, that's, and that's just simply because they are you know, philosophically basically different views. Um, but I just wanted to make this working distinction so that we know what we're talking about. So uh, housing affordability is how, how I see it. 
I would like to say useful for the teachers when I know what we talk about, um, is basically more of an urban concerns about the system settings and price levels in the aggregate and how the system is responding such that um, prices across all kinds of housing consumption is lower, <laughs> basically, right? Um, then affordable housing is more about the production or the provision of units at a certain price, the back of a if a price point is maybe below market, right? And that could be subsidized, it can be provided by central government, local government, uh, community housing price, or other means like inclusionary zoning, where that is provided by the private sector, but it's mandated. Um, okay. Uh, I just would like to situate the problem a bit. Um, so in the remit, it says that uh, the, well, the, the problem that's, that's pointed out is that uh, local authorities are basically, or areas are basically struggling to provide a certain type of housing. And that is this kind of more affordable range type housing for median low income. Um, and the proposed response is to give councils more tools, basically, so that they, and one of the ones that such tools, and particularly value capture tools, uh, would be inclusionary zoning. Um, okay, so I just want to talk a little bit about the problem itself, and also in the context of housing for the use of housing, and um, where, this, where this fits. So this is just a general look across New Zealand in terms of housing affordability, if we look at price income ratios, so that is how much people earn median income, complete household income compared to health to house prices. Um, if you accept, not, not many accept this, like not everyone accepts this index, so I'm just pointing out if you if you would apply this index to New Zealand, then this will be the output, which is basically that we are unaffordable all across, pretty much, to severely unaffordable. <coughs> um, so this is, uh, this is what I'm trying to talk about here is more the affordability side, the urban land side that I was pointing out before. It's the aggregate, aggregate price levels. Okay, so this is an image that I've taken from the time when I was working at HUD, uh, sorry, at Treasury. Um, so I, I wanted to just cash out a bit what we sort of what the issue around the affordability is. Um, I'm not saying that this is the problem because I think the paper points out that we might not agree what the cause of unaffordability is. So I just want to put this forward as a one way of thinking through it. So what one, one a key issue that what, an issue that we might be facing is that we have planning constraints for whatever reason, and I don't want to actually go into it, what what the cause of that reason is: infrastructure, the economy, and, you know, funding and financing. Um, what is it all about? Um, so one one challenge that we're finding is that the constraints are basically resulting in a situation where there's scarcity of development capacity and therefore land prices are going up. Um, well, prices generally going up, but particularly land prices, and the land uh, market isn't very, very competitive. And basically, economic rents. So, um, uh, but basically, uh, value like is being transferred above the tra like above commercial rent, above just basic commercial rent. So, the rent for the what you pay for the land is more over and above what you would otherwise pay in a reasonable re competitive market. Um, so, what we find is once the constraints are in place, that as soon as we do something. I think it just makes the situation worse because it gets captured by the landowners. Um, so it doesn't really matter what we do, is, and until we can solve that problem, the value gets captured. And this is basically, I think, the intuition of inclusion zoning is that we then say, well, if we can't solve this problem, then we might as well force the capture of that value. Okay, okay so I'm um, talking about this also uh, because there was this actually rather awesome image in that report. Um, uh, so basically saying that it's not just about the average price value across in the aggregate, right? It's also about the provision of the range of white houses, which also allows the provision of affordable types of housing. Um, so when you see that the slope is more flat, but more broader, so you have a larger range of types of houses that can be accessible. Um, so I think the point that I want to make that is a, um, so there's affordability and affordable housing kind of question here. One, on one hand, we need to actually reduce the uh, the price in aggregate because of the cost that it's imposing on the entire system, which is unmanageable fiscally. Not, like we can't actually continue on this path. Um, and the other one is that we also need a larger typology and range of choice, which is what the affordable housing or the inclusion zoning is kind of speaking to. And I just wanted to, um, I think, I don't know if it's my conclusions here, but yeah, no, if, if you want to think about, if you really believe that a flatter slope is better, and that a larger range is more useful then that challenges compact cities because compact cities will condense the range of options um, that you actually have available and it will actually increase the aggregate price levels unless you can rapidly recycle land use at a rate that we might be challenged to really do because of the development economics as you go up because of the path dependence of the cities and because of the investment required in the infrastructure and there's a massive like when, as soon as you go into intensification there's an investment required for the 
infrastructure that is way above what you would otherwise expect and that actually pushes the prices up. Okay. Um, so one, oh yeah, so I think that, uh, when we talk about treasure signing, I don't think we should be thinking about, why well, we, we can, you know, this is a for debate. I don't think it's about uh, discussing affordability. I don't think it's about solving for a bit. I think the report points up that out pretty well. Um, at the same time, uh, given the situation, I think it also says in the report that political economic, the political situation is, is one where that might not be changed. So in the face of that, value, value capture or inclusion zoning might be a response to improve that, that kind of range of topology. So where does this kind of fit? This is how I think about the housing intervention at large that's going on or has been going on. This might be changing now. Um, but we're basically looking for housing outcomes either through the market or not through the market. And then we're also looking at other types of outcomes through the housing market. And that's maybe, you know, for example, climate change and so forth. So um, the way I'm thinking about it is that inclusion zoning is really um, more on the right hand to uh, about uh, the provision of units rather than changing the system settings um, and how the whole urban development system works. Um, although it is through the market in, the, in the general sense because you're kind of mandating the market to provide a certain, um, uh, certain type of house. Okay, so, and this is just a, a big conditional. So if um, we're in agreement um, that that is the case, that in, that it doesn't really address affordability, but it's a matter of providing a certain number of affordable housing which is the choice of house. Um, then uh, my position would be that it's a surgical tool. So we have to be, know how to apply it and when to apply it. So that it's, you know, as mentioned, it's done well and that we don't have like negative or a, a worse situation in um, I think that a big question is going to be the term auxiliary <laughs> because um, that means in the absence of other interventions that would otherwise work to address affordability. And I think we are at a point where that might be a reality, where we might have to face that fact that we are going to have, well, not that we have answers to the problem, but it's politically not feasible. That's what I've learned in my work so far. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm asked to set up a working group and that's, I've been working on that. I've been ringing around, I've been you know talking to people that I know from my previous work. And I, um, I know that someone from HUD is here, so I, I want to, Point out clearly that I'm not permitting HUD here. So they have got an initial <laughs> an initial agreement uh, to participate, to come to the table, to have a conversation. So others have committed more, more strongly, but um, I just want to so there's there's interest to, to have a conversation, there's interest to come together to work. Um, but um, at the same time, I acknowledge that particularly central government departments are a bit, you know, for for very good reasons, careful to fully commit, right? So at this stage, I these um, uh, these people, like agencies, um, have committed to come to the table and have a real conversation, which is, I think is really awesome. Um, and I'll, I'm looking to pick up that next year. So thinking about the working group, I want to think about how I'm thinking of working through this. Um, uh, there are some fundamental questions that are raised with inclusion rezoning, particularly about the planning of this, and that's this image that I showed you before where they're um, I'll go back uh, here where the pink area is kind of an uplift of value, right? Um, and there's quite a steep drop from where the cities and where the boundaries are and uh, the rural area. There's a big debate around this. So I don't want to say this is, there's a big debate whether this is natural or this is man-made. Uh, someone, uh, a planner from Christchurch once said in one of our webinars that it's a publicly bestowed gift. In this case, it, but I, I would interpret that that is actually a man-made phenomenon. So um, no, I'm not saying that that is the case, but I'll interpret from those words that that is what he means. So if that is the case, then I, we might have the power to address this issue. But um, uh, okay. So I think the attitude that we take towards this question, whether, for example, the planning uplift is a given or not, and whether we have any influence over it, would determine to a large extent, I think, to a large extent, the people's attitudes towards this question of inclusion designing at large because it might then appear that it might be working at odds with the project to achieve housing affordability because in an awkward sense for inclusion design to work, I'm putting that out there as a point of discussion, uh, you might have to actually uh, a priori, so in the first, sorry, in the first instance, um, constrain the city. You'd have to clamp down on the city to, to actually then have negotiating power to provide them with that capacity that you would have not put forward in advance. Um, and, it, and that is actually what then, in a way, what creates the kind of economic rent or the, the, this massive value generation um, that you then seek to capture. But if you actually solve the affordability problem, there might not be, you know, like the situation looks different. 
And the, the challenge then would be that as you look to, to use a specific tool like inclusion zoning, that you don't get distracted by that by saying that, okay, now I'm using inclusion zoning, now I'm actually addressing the problem. Yeah. Okay. So just mm, quick, the, the different type of my proposition, my basic one is that there are different types of markets, different types of cities, right? And they function differently. And depending on what we, how we interact with those markets, it's going to be working differently. Like if we, for example, have uh, house, existing house prices and rents that are um, below what it, below the cost of construction, then as soon as we have more demand coming in, um, people will bid up the price of the existing stock first before the development economics they can't actually build. So we just basically, if you go here, like we're bidding up, bidding up um, the prices before then the, the supply response, the response actually starts kicking in. And so if we think about inclusionary zoning, um, if we apply inclusionary zoning in a situation where the, the prices are above construction, the prices are below construction, the situation looks very different in terms of what the impact might be of inclusionary zoning. In one situation, it would make it worse. The development economics start getting more costly, so the, the, the response is delayed even further. Or in the other situation, we have another debate of the planning uplift and whether it's a tax, well, it is going to be a tax, but whether the tax is distortionary in the market. That's another question that we didn't have to debate and discuss. Last two minutes, if I have, legislation. Um, in the status quo, it does look like we would, if we want to do this, we would need legislation. I do also agree that the national policy statement might not be sufficient. Um, the question now um, is though, given the environment that we're in, I just want to put that challenge forward. There's a bigger challenge in my work that I'm facing uh, in local government, and that is um, the iron reform, also the three waters reform as well. Um, if if, if I'm correct in my understanding that uh, the Randerson report is, is going to be taken as the blueprint for the iron reform, which is what I've been told. And if uh, what I've been told by the agency is correct, that basically key decisions around the iron reform, um, so key decisions going to be right here, are going to be made by Christmas or January on the Natural Built Environment Act, then our, our window of opportunity is very short. <laughs> It's closed, maybe. I don't know. I'm not quite sure. Um, the Spatial Planning Act has a bit more room, as I, I've heard, to actually influence. And I think it's not just that. So the key problem that I have is that the what is proposed in the Randerson report is basically saying that uh, councils will, will no longer be decision makers in planning, either in combined plans or spatial plans. That means across the entire board. So the entire conversation about inclusion zoning and what the councils might decide, for me, <laughs> is a for me and my work, is a question underneath a more primary question. So I think that, that's it, that's me. So it's just sort of contextualizing, I'm setting up a working group in a very interesting environment. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> Kia I just want to actually take a moment because we're going to pivot a little bit um, to hearing from Philip Reid now from Auckland Council and just provide you with what's already been hinted at, which is kind of the bigger strategic picture, which may be coming to an end at Christmas time, according to, you know, <laughs> just terrifying. Um, so, you know, the momentum has been building quite a lot and there's been um, a bit of talk about inclusionary zoning and of course Queenstown's been bubbling away for 10 years now. Um, Hamilton now has a uh, Lands Trust, which is in a position to take up the inclusionary zoning opportunity. Um, Auckland Council has also been considering it in the last few months, well, technically for maybe two years or 18 months or something, but I, I won't um, go ahead and fill too much. Uh, but just so, so from our perspective, you know, we, we want you to communicate with us as chair about your thoughts about this. We absolutely want to hear people's oppositions and people's support for inclusionary zoning. Um, we're also talking to Auckland Council about um, hosting an, 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 an Auckland Conversations event in March or April next year so that we can really bring this out in, a, in an even bigger forum, which is kind of a little bit more integrated with Auckland Council's political environment. Um, and we're going to be working alongside uh, Benno and his aspirations to pull together a pretty significant cross-government uh, working group on inclusionary zoning in the first half of next year. So I just wanted to give you a little bit more of the context of where we're trying to go with this workshop today, um, which is generating uh, the conversation, generating the feedback uh, to us and to others, and hopefully putting New Zealanders in a better position to communicate with their local authorities and their local elected members about inclusionary zoning in the 
opportunity it presents. So without further ado, and thank you to the first two speakers for keeping it nice and sharp. Uh, Phil Reid uh, from Auckland Council. I won't try and remember your position. No, I'm trying to. Man. Yeah, please. <laughs> All right, thank you, um, Brennan. And probably also just a, a thank you to um, bringing this together in particular to and um, I thought that discussion paper was a fantastic research paper um, to help bring this um, together. And um, it is sort of a, a story that, is, that does go back many years. I was commenting to David Mead that I went to a presentation of Princess Wharf by David um, talking about the efforts back in 2006 to commence this uh, for Queenstown. So it's been um, good to watch that through the years. And David's been a champion um, right through for a military plan process as well. So. Um, just a little bit of context about myself. So I was district plan manager for North Shore City Council, uh, original unitary plan manager for Auckland Council. I was the planning manager for the independent hearings panel for the unitary plan, and I'm currently the Auckland Borough Plan Manager for Auckland. So um, there's been a couple of presentations to our planning committee, and just acknowledge Brennan and all the other presentations that you've been members that as well. Um, it's certainly an issue which um, uh, is close to the heart of our elected members, uh, and um, Suffice to say, there are definitely some frustrations around this one. So, trying to find a way through it is what we're here for. So, just probably to um, put this in a broader context so, inclusionary zoning um, as a work stream for Auckland Council sits within an affordable housing work program more generally. Um, so, there have been a few reports through to our planning committee. So, uh, do take note of those dates if you do wish to look up the agendas. Uh, and to look at the broader scope of considerations that have occurred. Um, essentially, it was um, starting wide, getting narrower, and our last report in November um, zeroed in, in particular on inclusionary zoning uh, and did look at the um, special housing area legislation and implications of that, in particular for places like Bosonville. Um, we did what we could to explain the Queenstown situation through the years and the legal cases there. And, where they're at from a strategic as well as a policy perspective. Uh, and, and, and then we went into some of the details of inclusion and zoning, both in a mandatory way and a voluntary way. So it just gives you a bit of a feel without um, trying to strain your eyes too much. Um, the green is work that's going on at the moment, blue work, which is to occur, there's research work, and there's also advocacy work through central government. And this, covers a broader range in relation to affordable housing. So we've got issues such as homelessness in this public kind of housing uh, and the whole monitoring perspective as well on affordability. This is a slide which went to the planning committee um, where we attempted to try and sort of boil things down for the mandatory inclusionary zones. So um, the approach of uh, if you do more than X number of dwellings, you need to provide Y in relation to affordable housing. Uh, either in a retained sense to the community housing provider or in a relative sense at market price. Um, so we saw some distinct challenges in that one. Um, and I think that's reflected in the local government New Zealand paper as well as the discussion document as well. So um, it was my role to essentially express the degree of risk that we saw in progressing such a plan change at this point in time. Uh, and that has led to um, the advocacy approach that I'll talk to more fully. I probably just um, should mention that the, um, the local context for Auckland uh, being tested through the work which we had from the hearings panel uh, did result in some further recommendations from our hearings panel, which we did take into account in addition to the Environment Court, High Court and Court of Appeal work for Queenstown. Uh, so in the, in the local context, um, the view of that hearing panel was that it was a general pricing mechanism that we were looking to progress, some council was looking to progress. The voluntary inclusion reason, um, the, the issue we face for Auckland is that as we went through um, from the original notified version of the unitary plan through to the version that we've got now, the document itself has become far more enabling as we've gone through time. Uh, and it's also fair to say that the quid pro quo of that enablement uh, at the time of notification was the high quality design aspects that were built into the plan. Uh, right or wrongly, where we're at now, it's still 
very much an, an enabling and supply driven um, plan with not quite so much in the way of uh, mechanisms around design and uh, no mechanisms that currently sit within it in relation to inclusion and rezoning. Parallel to that, we of course had the special housing areas that were working their way through. And it was unbeknownst to applicants at that time exactly the final form of what the entry plan would have. So many of them took up that opportunity to utilise those sort of speedier and less appeal right processes uh, and gain approval under that legislation. Uh, and I think as you've seen from some of the documentation and the actual results that have come through have been a bit disappointing in terms of the actual delivered number of uh, retained or relative affordable housing from that, which is partly a result of the extent to which people have have stepped back and said, well, I'll relinquish some of those approvals that I've got and now seek approval under the industry plan given this regime is, is very enabling and doesn't carry some of those requirements of affordable housing. So where we got to with the planning committee was to, to look at a, a strong advocacy-based approach, um, which is what we're looking to do. So there's been a political working party that's been formed. So we've got um, Councillor Josephine Bartley, Councillor Kathy Casey, Councillor Linda Cooper, and IMSB member Tony Kake, um, and potentially other members of councillors, of councillors may join that as well. Um, the responsibility of that working party is the Affordable Housing Work Program as a whole, um, but we will be meeting with them in the next month or two specifically on this issue of the development of a coordinated advocacy plan to central government. Um, so, I might just talk to that advocacy plan first because the, the intent of that is to actually have a simplified document that sits for both staff members within council and their interactions with central government, as well as for all members of the council and the interactions they have as well. So that it's a consistency of <coughs> problem representation and a consistency of advocacy for certain mechanisms or tools. And we're very much aligned to local government New Zealand in relation to what some of those tools are. I, I do tend to agree that the uh, national policy statement technique on its own may not necessarily cut the mustard. Uh, I do think that, um, uh, as was alluded to, I think within the Territorial Housing Affordability Bill and the preface, uh, there was recognition about the fact that part two in the South may actually need to be done <coughs> as well to actually more clearly articulate the need for affordable housing as a potential matter of national significance. Um, we will also be progressing some other things as well, in particular. Um, the idea of value of the flippy as well. Whether that sits as it currently is um, portrayed as something which is a direct nexus through to um, the issue of provisional affordable housing, or whether it sits more broadly in relation to some of the costs which society face as a result of either planning or infrastructure delivery decisions. Um, to give you a nice little analogy, um, when the um, unitary plan was notified and we first painted some areas yellow across the region for a future urban zone, uh, like there were stories of people that hired helicopters and literally flew with real estate agents over areas such as Kumu and said, I'll buy that, I'll buy that, I'll buy that. So drilling down further into the inclusion rezoning itself and what some of our uh, considerations would be. Um, so I think as, as pointed out in the useful summary section at the end of the discussion paper, um, there does need to be quite a lot of work done uh, in looking particularly at a, a market such as Auckland, which um, has quite a few diverse aspects to it, different affordability issues, different locations, different um, job markets, um, different development interests, different extents of land banking, those sort of things. So it does require quite a granular approach and understanding from Section 32 point of view and building uh, such a plan change. Um, assuming that we can actually get a, a nice legislative policy um, playing field in place to be able to build such a plan change, these are the considerations that we look into more closely. And so, um, together with that summary list that sits in the discussion paper, uh, I don't want to underplay um, the extent of research and work which we need to go on by staff in order to build such a plan change to give it the greatest chance of success. Um, knowing the extent of work and variance of position uh, that council took through the hearings process and the degree of questioning and opposition that there, uh, there was heaped upon um, David in particular, um, this is a, a, a plan change which would still attract a, a huge amount of interest uh, and therefore needs to be strong in its cost benefit analysis. So 
So, you know, we'd like to work with you um, from an LGMC perspective. Um, and I think we will first need to actually just um, deliver a nice concise advocacy plan for our elected members. Um, but then building on that and going into the detail, um, I would like to be able to um, look at mechanisms that we can take uh, or research that we can provide to you um, to be able to help you. Uh, so we're, we're pivoting essentially from what was a series of reports to planning committee, which were looking more strongly at um, scoping and starting work on plan change, uh, to now focusing on the advocacy to, play, to make that playing field um, strong enough um, for that plan change to survive, uh, rather than investing a huge amount of time and effort into something which uh, is still quite a high risk again uh, in our mind. And, does have some differences to Queenstown, but we will obviously watch Queenstown very closely. Thank you. It all sounds so easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, again, what we wanted to do is really point out there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, this is, again, the start of that journey. Obviously, people are already into a lot of this detail, but that detail requires more work, more conversations, and more engagement. Um, so it, it is definitely a, a work in progress here, but hopefully it starts to solidify kind of what we know, what we don't know, and what those steps are going to be. But it, clearly what, what we're hearing is that advocacy, getting the certainty under legislation is really a, a prerequisite for things if we're going to progress. Next up, David. Oh, great. Yeah, interesting. Do you have no, no presentation, I no, no. 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 So no, I've been doing a PowerPoint reading, so um, I'm getting a bit naked now, of course, I'm doing <laughs> <laughs> We can run something right Yeah, that'd be good, that'd be good. Uh, yeah, so I've got a planning background, town planning background, and it's probably sort of gleaned from the previous discussions. I've had a couple of cracks now at trying to do inclusion rezoning. One down in Queenstown and one up in Auckland. Uh, down in Queenstown had the assistance of Trish Austin, I can see there, and then one uh, up in Auckland, um, got Larry Murphy involved, I thought I'd sort of step up, get a professor, that might make a difference. <laughs> Didn't make any difference at all. <laughs> but it was good effort. Um, so, yeah, down in Queenstown, I mean, just very briefly, um, uh, yeah, the, actually what had happened there is actually some of the private developers had come forward. They had wanted plan changes to the district plan. At the time, the plan was getting quite old out of, out of Kilda. Uh, the council had a review process, but it was a few years off, and they sort of started to come forward saying, well, we'd like to do a plan change to rezone this area, the housing, uh, but we'll include a, 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 some sort of affordable housing requirement as part of that process. And you might say that was partly a sort of bargaining chip to the council, you know, we'll give you a goodie if you allow us to do that. I think some of the developers actually were quite genuine about it, because I think they realised down in Queenstown there was particular problems. Uh, about affordable housing, and if they didn't provide some housing for the builders or the construction workers or the you know the people who are going to work in the police or the teachers or something, there's fundamentally going to be a problem down there in the Queenstown at some point. You know the economy was probably going to run into a big brick wall. Um, so there were sort of various attempts. Um, some of them were sort of arm twisting by the council, saying, "Well, these guys are giving us an affordable housing requirement. You know, you do the two. But they were sort of patchy, and they were all different. You know, each plan change was different. So I got involved with Scott, um, where they wanted to sort of, well, let's put it all together and provide a framework for the district plan. It seems like a sensible idea, uh, rather than a sort of spotty sort of approach. Um, so we worked with Trisha on a um, housing strategy first. That set up the Housing Trust. Didn't really know what the Housing Trust was going to do, but we thought it was a good idea. Miles would have one. Uh, and of course, the plan site turned out to be a great thing. Um, so um, we worked through sort of various steps about sort of options, all that Section 32 stuff. Uh, notified a plan change, did get quite complex. I kind of blame Scott for that. He's not here, so I can sort of blame him for the sort of background and, and uh, the approach he took. We kind of pinned it back to um, employment and uh, you know, tourism, basic drivers of the growth of the area, um, was all that sort of uh, tourism related sort of uh, you know, pressure. So what's the employment going to be generated? Um, and you know, out of that, what is the demand for those sort of key workers, you know, the, the teachers or the policemen or whatever it might be? Uh, got quite complex, but hey, that's all, you know, life under the RMA is complex, so that's not a problem. Um, went through the first instant hearing, you know, the submission 
process heard by council, said, yep, fine, made some changes. Uh, went then to the appeal process in off the environment court. Um, and the first issues that were dealt with were more sort of a principle sort of thing about people saying, well, this is not part of the RMA. You know, the RMA is about environmental management. You stick to look after the landscapes and all that sort of stuff. You're into a social field here on the outside of the RMA. Uh, and the, the environment court said, oh, well, no, hang on, you know, there might be a bit of a reason here down, especially in Queenstown, you know, it's um, what you're talking about, uh, you know, the landscapes down here immediately put you into a sort of a compact city sort of approach because you can't spread out there forever in a day. You'd ruin the landscape, you'd ruin the economy, so there won't be sense to do something. Um, and that decision got appealed, went off to the High Court, um, again on a basic principle, uh, point of law. And the High Court came back and said, oh, no, look, you know, again, we can see the RMA, flexible thing. There's nothing in the RMA that says you can't have affordable housing, so there's a potential for it to happen. Um, at that point, there was talk about going off, whatever it is, after the High Court, whether you go to the Appeal Court or something. Um, came down to two developers. Um, who really were just saying, well, look, on principle, we don't think you should go there. And we're going to just take it all the way. Have to go up with Privy Council, whatever it is, you know, we'll do it. Uh, change of council, um, did sort of get into that sort of financial crash, 2008 sort of period. Oh, well, they all pulled back at that point. The council said, oh, well, look, we'll just have to drop it. It's too much hard work. Don't want to go there. Um, uh, then shift the focus up here from the unitary plan, like Paul was talking about. I uh, thought, well, let's have another crack, another go. There's going to be a lot of rezoning to go on out in Greenfield, but also in terms of, um, you know, in the brownfield areas with the um, dam zone and all the rest of it. Um, and, okay, different sort of situation. As I said, down in Queenstown, there's probably a, a strong argument about uh, landscape protection. It inevitably means you've got restricted opportunities in terms of urban environments, and inevitably there's going to be downplay, uh, you know, consequences for um, uh, access to housing. Auckland, of course, the argument is, well, we can just carry on sprawling it out wherever we want to, and we can, you know, add some more tower blocks, and we've got lots of houses to buy, so it's not a problem. You know, what are you worried about? How do you justify this under the RMA? <coughs> uh, and it's a good question. Well, I don't know if I completely got the right answer, but um, I guess the, the issue became potentially one more about, well, uh, you know, we need an efficient city, but we also need a city that's equitable, you know, that gives people equal access to that efficiency. You can't really just have efficiency on one hand, forget about equity on the other. And I think that's sort of where we came back to, this sort of the main argument. There were arguments about, well, you know, there's going to have to be a heap of public infrastructure put into these areas. That then flows through into land prices and that sort of captures the side of things to be dealt with. Um, so uh, we did some more work at that point, around with Larry Murphy and Co about development feasibility, perhaps we just throw it down in Queenstown. Um, you know, what would be the issues in terms of development fees, what would be included in the inclusionary zoning requirement? Um, you know, would it make some development feasible? Push them over the line. Um, Greenfields showed a pretty solid case um, about, you know, a well structured, modest requirement wouldn't make Greenfields unfeasible. I mean, of course, that's a generalisation, but you know, generally, yeah. Brownfields, yes, can be getting more complex because of all the. Um, Existing property that you're going to buy and the value of that will get a little different and risky, but it's still, you know, could be done. Um, so, uh, developed up an inclusionary zoning approach in the uh, draft plan that got consulted on, sort of general comments yes and no, not a bad idea, carry on through to the inventory plan, notified. Uh, I mean, at, at the end of the day, you might have said a modest amount of submissions, wouldn't just for a huge amount. Um, I've got to say, though, it turned up to the hearing, uh, the main opposition. At the time of the hearing, it was actually central government. So it was actually uh, MB and uh, Housing New Zealand at the time, and Treasury all turned up and said, No, no, don't do this, don't do this. You know, you've got to do the supplies, the way to go, the efficiency side of things, that's what we should concentrate on. Um, if you have this sort of affordable housing, you know, uh, requirement, you may well give up all the, the, the supply argument. I think that's what they're really worried about. That if, if you had this sort of shiny, you know, tool over here to do with affordable housing, you wouldn't need to worry about supply so much. And um, I think that's where the panel was too. I wasn't part of the panel, so it's up to them. But I think they were sort of under the hammer so much around the supply at the time, Nick Smith, all that sort of stuff about we need to just need to provide supply, that they sort of thought, well, we just better carry on down that track. Um, and so they came out with the negative recommendation around affordable housing requirement. That went back to the council committee because the council could still say, no, you, we're going to do our own thing. But at that point again, I think the council was so exhausted with the whole entry plan process that they couldn't stop it. <laughs> Too hard. Um, as you said, Phil said, a sort of a remnant sort of uh, uh, 
on that remnant sort of what would you call it the sort of a the funny little version of it found its way into the special housing area process and again the special housing areas gave council a um an administrative you know ability to say yes or no we will support you to go into this area or not separate from the RMA and they could use that as a process saying well especially that done in Queenstown okay if you want to have that as a special housing area you've got to give us 10 percent affordable lots for example and that's just a straight sort of you know um, administrative uh, technique that they've used so um Queenstown, we're um, we're interested in having another go, um, especially the special housing area legislation falling away. They want to look at what's possible down there, um, and we're working through some options at the moment about that. Um, I guess here back to where you guys are all at. Um, yeah, it, I mean it is not an easy road to hoe under the RMA. I, I think there's still scope within the RMA to do it though. Um, particular circumstances, yes, the cities, it's not even it's not a general policy. You have to pick the areas. Queenstown is the classic sort of case. But a big metropolitan centre, I think, like Wellington, Auckland, Christchurch, I think, you know, there's issues there that you look at in terms of equity. You know, if you end up in a city with all the rich people over here and all the poor people over here, then you've immediately got problems in terms of transport and infrastructure and a whole of other things to be dealt with. Um, separate from the issues to do with, you know, um, land value capture and things like that. So in terms of where you want to head, um, uh, you know, I think the RMA reform is an obvious place to head at the moment. Um, I suggest that sort of a headline thing is to try to get this idea of an equitable urban environment in there, not just efficiency, but equity, to try and get that concept in there even at the moment. It may even allow space for these things to sort of spill in and move along. Would be dangerous, I think, to have a separate act. We had that with the um, Trish worked on that, didn't you? The affordable housing, whatever it is, the heater act. A heater act, is it? Yeah, that's right. Um, and of course, being a separate act which allowed for affordable housing to be built into district plans. It became very easy to just to um, carve it off and some of them didn't like it. I think the National Party, when they came in after the Labour government, they just sort of said, oh, fuck it, this don't need that, that's, you know, stuff. Um, <laughs> and, and so they went, oh, so I think, yeah, the more we can sort of build it in as part of that urban planning um, and this idea of, of, of equity, um, uh, I think there's, there's room to play there. I mean, there is a very interesting stuff going on, like in the ecological sphere too these days, which I'll look at. I love to talk about outcomes, not just about mitigating and trying to sort of, you know, make things not too bad, but actually improve things. Um, and the whole idea of sort of offsets and compensation and things growing, not just about mitigation. And I think when we start to think about the urban environment in terms of outcomes, there's a particular, you know, there's a similar sort of line of thinking that can be applied. I mean, it needs a discipline around it, of course. Um, can't be completely up and ended, um, but that would be, I think, something to hit. Thank you. Thank you. I might just pause there, um, just since everyone's been so bang on time, which is extraordinary. Uh, I'm just going to suggest we'll have a quick Q and A. So I've got the first two questions. Um, <laughs> is there a Martin Cooper with us? Martin, hi. Cool, just checking. Uh, okay, great, our program's full. Uh, and the second question, David, um, were you suggesting that the independent hearings panel may have been influenced by the politicians? No, that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> um, no, I, no, I mean, I suddenly realised, of course, these things are all recorded, aren't they? So oh. I, I just want to retract everything I've said, okay? <laughs> Same here. I retract my question. But no, so we'll take um, five minutes for um, a little refreshment. Um, and But also, if anyone's got a burning question for any of our speakers so far, um, we'll just take a couple of questions if anyone wants to. Trisha. Um, hi, I'm Trisha Austin. Um, I sit as a quite tech, and I was working with David on the Queenstown Lakes, um, meeting our new staff and doing our district management, and the affordable housing and all the local authorities and acts, which would have allowed all, well, it did, but yeah. Allow all local hmm. authorities to do this if they want to, and then John can do this right now. Um, my, my main first cut was comment really, and it was to do with the, the, the comments that David made at the beginning. When we were looking for an argument uh, to hang things on, and you need an argument, obviously, you know, when it's on the environment courts or what have you, um, going, it's this whole do you go for 5%, do you go for 10%, do you go for 15%, how do you get the number if you stay in the inclusionary zone world? Because that's inevitably the one that will get challenged in the courts. It's like, well, you know, we might give you five and then again, we might give you 15, you know? Unless you live in California and you're okay with it. Because the government's already signed up. Like, 15%, I think. Yeah. 
So we went into the numbers region, that's actually called linkage, so I think my location is only when people like Googling it. And the idea was that any sort of development, and it could be a new golf course, it could be an expansion of the ski fields, that means I'm going to Queenstown in the examples, obviously, could generate a large amount of new employment in the district, and there's people who have got to live somewhere, and they could be pushing out people, you know, if they just have somewhere to live, they'd be pushing out or raising the rents for everybody in the district. And so we, we use a linkage zone which gets you an actual number um, based on the size of the department. And you can do it actually for residential as well as tiers on a linkage. And yes, it's numbers and it gets complicated. And I don't think they actually like to very much increase how many came down to it. They much prefer like you know five percent or ten percent. But we were trying to come up with an argument that was about mitigating because of the way the RMA is structured. And at the time, no one was happy to go equity. Now, maybe things will have done, and maybe the RMA will get to them now, or the RMA will form, but that, that was the reason for them. If anyone wants to know more about them, that's just a comment. Thanks, Trish. That's good. Carolyn, thanks, Trish. Um, another quick question? We'll, we'll breakfast in the morning tea. To kick us off after our break, uh, I'd like to welcome Imogen Scoots from the Society for Alternative Housing and Development, uh, who's going to take us through uh, her perspective on the benefits inclusionary zoning could bring. Hello, I'm Imogen Scoots, nice to be introduced. Thanks. I'm a proud and active member of the Society for Alternative Housing and Development, who promote community-focused housing. That's housing where individuals take an active and leading role in addressing their own housing needs. I'm going to share with you a key way we can address Tamaki Makao's housing affordability crisis. Doing this will make sure Auckland stays productive and vibrant, efficient and equitable. I'm going to show you how community land trusts work, why they have been so successful internationally, and how they could benefit Tamaki Makao as an inclusionary zoning complement. Why? Because we all know someone who's struggling to maintain housing security. We all want our favourite downtown restaurant to keep its best chef. The chef who can only afford to live on the fringes of Auckland and needs to travel at least an hour each day, each way. The widening affordability gap will, will impact us all. So in terms of what I'll cover off on today, who we're talking about in relation to this type of housing, who needs it and why. Community land trusts, show some of your video, keep a bit of New Zealand context. Um, there's an amazing case study that Panuku started off in the beginning of this year, which is a really good um, piece of evidence that supports community land trusts as well, and a bit about next steps. So as I said, I'm a proud and active member of the Society for Alternative Housing Development. We advocate, inform and educate around different community focused housing models, a key one of those being community land trusts. We were incorporated early last year and we're a member based, a volunteer based organisation. So across the community focused housing approaches that society advocates for, community land trusts being a key one of those, they are more affordable, they provide for economic, social and environmental sustainability. They enable and foster community, create greater well-being, provide better quality and build capacity of its occupants. So we're talking about affordable housing, those that don't qualify for social housing and those that can't afford to own their own home. It might be aspirational, but predominantly we'll never be able to reach and own their own home. Brief little video that explains this quite well. Their lives on hold because they cannot afford high rents or a deposit to buy a home. 
for some purpose of ever having the three party pension conditions. Simple allowances, families of living lifestyles, and also for the services such as shops, pubs, and schools of pricing. Elsewhere, whole neighborhoods are lighted by empty properties, hit investments, and very few generation initiatives. In response to this, people everywhere are coming together to develop local solutions. They're setting up CLTs, community land trusts and local organizations set up and run by volunteers to develop and manage genuinely affordable homes based on what people actually earn, as well as pubs, shops, gardens, or workspaces. And not just for now, but for every future occupier. This means that CLT residents will have enough money left to spend on living. And because the community is in the driving seat, they can build the housing it really wants, including design and allocations, and they can make use of the land before development. Here's how it works. First of all, the land is bought by or transferred to the CLT. They then build the homes or assets, either by commissioning builders, by working with a developer or housing association, or by doing it themselves. There are over 175 community land trusts in England and Wales, half of which formed in the last two years, and there is huge potential for many more. The National Community Land Trust Network is the charity this Thanks for the audio assistance there, <laughs> much improved. Um, so the video gave a really quick and brief overview <laughs> of what community land trusts are, how they work and operate. So we can see that they have a different um, form of, of governance, being a third representatives of the community, a third public stakeholders, um, financiers, for example, and actually those that occupy the trust homes themselves. It ran through a little bit about how perpetual affordability can be achieved. And also talk about land transfer. So obviously inclusionary zoning is a key way that land could transfer into community land trusts. So this, the legal documentation that supports how land is managed and operated in um, trusts is through a ground, a ground lease. And they contain specific um, resale formulas which dictate um, how much property will be sold for in future for future occupants. So it maintains the subsidy that's provided initially and pays it forward. That's a key way that community land trusts retain and for affordability. So community land trusts um, own and uh, stewardship the land. They may or may not also stewardship the property or improvements on top of it. There is a way that different um, entities potentially can own and operate the, the group form on top of the trust land. So the this video is uh, made in 2016, and back as said, there's 175 um, trusts already in the UK. There are 250 community land trusts in the US. They're quite common in popular parts of Europe as well, Switzerland, Germany, the Netherlands. We have one already in Hawke's Bay, and obviously we've talked a little bit today about the one in Queenstown, um, but it's actually housing trust, not a land trust. So a key way that's different is that it has a different governance structure. A key benefit also of community land trusts is the diversity of individuals that they can serve. Um, they can be multicultural, they can be of different ages and backgrounds, and different eligibility. And a key way that we talked about before is that we're building capacity for those individuals that are members of the organisation as well. Um, also, Papakaenga and community land trusts have quite a lot of complementary synergies as well. So yeah, I've gone through a few features already. So reading on to a great piece of work that Panuku did earlier this year, which I had the good fortune of leading and was involved as well to keep people in this room on, was looking at how Auckland could achieve housing um, in a perpetually affordable way. And a key component of this also was that it would be of quality and be scalable and be replicable. So not surprisingly, the key finding of this outcome was that it would need to, it would require community land trust to be established. 
um, the process of this work went through a financial feasibility, there's different options and topologies and different options and locations as well. We also ran, in this piece of work, ran through a, an example for a, a family and what their experiences would be, particularly if they otherwise would be in a private open market and financially the difference between now and in 10 years time, their rental um, costs would be. I haven't got time to go into detail on that, but I'm very much looking forward to this piece of work being presented in more detail and more depth, because it's a very important piece of evidence of how Auckland can address this um, widening affordability gap that we're all fully aware of, and even more so now in recent um, months. So in relation to the next steps from here, we're obviously looking to continue this conversation and to deepen and lengthen our understanding across inclusionary zoning, as well as um, community and trusts. Um, that would be great through potentially a local conversations piece in March or April, as mentioned before. As I mentioned, the Society is um, a membership-based organisation. We definitely encourage um, membership for $25 only per, per member, and um, we also accept <coughs> donations as well. So yes, community land trust is one of the key answers to solve, to solve our affordability crisis in Auckland. So uh, just uh, one more speaker today, and what we'll do is I think Shemba, both Shemba Beal and Martin, and maybe some of the rest of you need to leave at 12. I know Shemba Beal and Martin both do, so I'll bring Shemba Beal up to say a few words, and um, then we'll get into some Q&A and maybe some discussion. Well, Brendan, you have a few things you wanted me to answer today, so um, there are two things that Brendan was really interested in. One was around the unit plan and the wider situation in terms of where does IZ fit in the broad scheme of things? Um, so I think you know our journey for inclusionary zoning has been tortured, right? We went through the inclusionary zoning process with the original plan. Um, what was put up was a bit of a bastardization of what IZ actually is, and it's not surprising that it failed. So um, you know we're kind of here because we didn't do it very well the first time around. The issue with the um, not the issue. The unitary plan was, in my view, quite a big success, right? We've managed to build lots more houses. Our current rate of build is the highest that we have had since the 1970s. Lots of great stuff going on. The problem is when you have a housing crisis that's just not about the number of houses, but also about affordability, building houses for rich folk doesn't actually help in terms of creating that supply at the bottom end of the continuum, which is really what we're talking about today is, Yes, we're going to fix total number of houses that we're building, but also we need to make sure that we get the full extent of topologies of housing, right? And so that's the bit that the unit plan wasn't able to get into in enough detail. It can impose density and those other things, but it doesn't resolve your affordability constraints. So if you look at the um, model that they have introduced in or have been using in Queenstown, um, while it's still very small and modest, um, what it does is it also deals with the affordability constraint. So being able to create houses that is held in perpetuity for the community, for those in the community who need it, that's the benefit of it. Um, and you know, the, the evidence on IZ is not nearly as negative as our previous speaker talked about, actually, it's much more mixed, and there are ways that you can actually do it well. So like with any policy, there are policies that are applied badly and policies that are applied well. So we just need to be mindful that when we're talking about things like inclusionary zoning, that we understand that it has constraints, that it's going to fit and work only for some people. It is part of the solution, and that's okay. And that we have to learn from other countries that have done it well compared to a lot of cities that have done it very badly. <clears throat> the issue, I think, is when you look at the housing crisis in New Zealand, this has been building for decades. Um, it has broken in almost every single part. So to say that we're only going to do this one thing, or only going to do this other thing, is not going to work. Um, and the whole point of inclusionary zoning and all of the conversations we're having together as an industry, as participants, as people from different perspectives, is it is a big, big complex problem, but we've got to fix all of those and move everything in the right direction. Right now, our challenge is despite having record rates of house building, we have record rates of people on the housing waitlist. There are more than 22,000 families that are on the waitlist that are in severe and immediate need of housing. We're failing. Despite building houses, we're not building houses for everybody. So, you know, it's really about saying what can we do that will create that immediacy of supply that is going to help people who need it now. So, yes, the long term, as an economist, I'll tell you, you know, the long term solution is we build more houses. 
Unfortunately, we don't live in North Africa. We live down there. And so the imperfections in the market is the bit that's the problem is we've got to wait for a long time for supply to catch up and the, we'll get there eventually. So, you know, what can I tell you? So when I, when I think about inclusionary zoning, when I think about all the conversations that we're having, it's more about saying, look, here is a market that is so broken in so many different pieces. Let's get all of those pieces working in the right direction. But let's not lose sight of the fact that there is a whole bunch of people in New Zealand who have terrible housing outcomes right now. In the same venue today, there is a workshop being done by the Human Rights Commission on the human right to shelter. That's the bit that we're failing on, right? We're actually, housing has become not a human right, but a commodity that is expensive and a luxury and all those other bits and pieces. We know that there are lots of reasons for it. And it includes all the things from planning to infrastructure to cost of building, the, you know, all of those pieces put together. So the question for us should be around when we are dealing in this particularly broken housing market and we're starting to make progress in some of these areas, how can we create some immediacy of supply that is going to be people who need it now? And that is the purpose and value of inclusionary zoning is it won't be suitable for everybody, but there is a small group of people for whom the gap falls through the cracks of social housing, affordable housing, and there is going to, it's that bit of the market that we can be very um, targeted about. And the other thing that we can do with community housing trusts, for example, is it has the ability for us to keep people in a secure house and home, regardless of their financial and economic situation. You can progress them through, through supports that could go from significant amount of support to relative independence, ownership, all of those other bits and pieces. So it is around the flexibility and thinking about how do we give people that shelter? And absolutely right. And if I was a heartless economist, I'd tell you just focus, focus on building more houses. But the reality is the lived experience of what we're seeing is there's a real urgency to provide a certain type of housing with a certain type of support that is not going to be possible if we just rely on social housing because the wait list is already so big or if we want to create affordable housing, which is in fact not very affordable for people. Um, build to rent is a big part of the solution. I'm a big fan of that and have been for a long time, but only if government comes in and says, as a result, you're going to have to provide um, rent controls and you're going to have to provide certain type of security and all those other bits and pieces. This is a, you know, it's a really big area of conversation and a really big topic. And I know you guys are all expert in this, but what I'd like you to take away from today and hopefully the conversation for you to lead is, what is the role of inclusionary zoning within this? The one part that we don't talk about enough, I think, is inclusionary zoning allows you to bring in ideas of value capture in the way that we do zoning uplets and those kinds of things. Value capture is a thing we don't talk about enough in New Zealand, um, but we know that if it's applied broadly across all the areas that are getting zoning changes, uh, particularly in green fields, it's a relatively easy way to raise capital for a sector that is actually very underfunded. So community housing sector does amazing work but they're not, they're not able to expand sufficiently because they don't have enough capital. So there's all this kind of missing pieces. It's all about trying to say, can we do something now that can um, connect up some of those dots? Um, it is not the solution. It is not the biggest solution, but it is a part of the solution. And in fact, a very important part of the solution. So let's keep it in that frame, I think, is think about it in terms of, as we have this conversation in Auckland and other places, how do we think about inclusion zoning being one part of the solution? but it's only one part. There's a whole bunch of other things that we've got to do. We still have to build lots of houses. We still need to get the typologies. But given where we're starting from, this incredible shortage, this incredibly unaffordable house prices, and in fact, un unaffordable rents in many parts of New Zealand, um, we are going to have to do something different. We need a circuit breaker. And in my mind, community housing providers and inclusionary zoning are some of those circuit breakers. Yeah, it's hard to get justice. It needs to be in three minutes. Um, so the outcome looked at two looked at different locations of Panuku owned land in Auckland. Did a um, cost comparison of if the land was transferred into a community land trust, um, and then the trust would have uh, had a grand lease, and it actually would be a cooperative that would sit on top of the trust to enable perpetual affordability, but also the greatest amount of affordability as well, which is a little bit complicated to get into detail about today. But yeah, in terms of the comparison uh, price difference for an example, family that was eligible for that housing, it was about $55 difference from the get-go between um, the open market comparable product or topology. And in 10 years' time, it would be about $300 difference between the two. The difference between the 
well, it added complexity was a bit about the um, share equity ownership and the cooperative structure, which was, yeah, another benefit, but it added complexity to explain that. Should I I wouldn't mind making a comment if I could. Sure, come on. I'm Peter Southwick. Um, I've been a trustee on the Queenstown Lakes Community Housing Trust for five years. Um, look, I, I reckon there's two things for me, um, particularly with what Martin was saying. I think the waters get muddied about what inclusionary zoning is. And at its most basic and successful level in Queenstown, it's where your land gets rezoned, you give sections to a housing trust um, or a lands trust. And so uh, the, the bit that Martin seemed to refer a lot to was this notion of we'll rezone your land if you agree to provide X percent of affordable housing. And so we've got some of those agreements down in the South Island. Um, they don't work. They're, they're just a complete waste of time. And, and so they don't achieve anything in the inclusion of rezoning space. And I think that muddying the waters with thinking that telling developers to provide some average cost housing in a development and that's inclusion rezoning, that's not what I think it is. I think it's developers giving up part of their land <coughs> that goes to a land trust. Land trusts then effectively get gifted land that they can build houses on. They can then offer houses as the Queenstown Trust do of leasehold models where the land is effectively taken out of the equation and houses are available to be provided at cost Best example I've seen up here in Auckland, there was an article in the Herald a while ago, piece of land in Oriwa, the developer bought it for $3.9 million. Um, it was zoned rural, he managed to convince council with a flourish of their signature on a piece of paper to zone that land residential. He then on sold it four years later for $63 million. So the community got no benefit from that. If there'd been inclusion rezoning as I, as I understand it, and a proportion of that land is gone into <coughs> Community ownership. Who would have cost? Who would have really paid the price of it? Not developers building houses. The guy, the person who owns that land that gets rezoned, they really pay the price of it up front. And the developers that might buy it off them, they factor that into what they will pay to buy the land. So I just think that the that the argument is muddied by lots of things. But being on a running, being part of a trust and receiving freehold land. From Developers, you can do a lot with it, and you can provide affordable housing. Yeah, very good. And, and, and certainly in California, where we're seeing those things, yeah, some of them were done poorly. And I think, uh, Martin, thank you for coming and providing the perspective of developers, because I think asking developers to serve a market that they don't work in is a hard ask. Similarly, you know, we don't ask the community land trust to go and market luxury homes. It's not the market that we work with. So as we design these programs, we need to keep these considerations in mind and who's best place to deliver and to retain that value long run. And the examples you gave about you know, who's monitoring, how are you assuring that the people that you want to benefit, that you get those outcomes for households uh, is a strong consideration. And when it's not done well, it undermines the integrity of the program. Because who, why would a developer give up profit and hand it to a household that can resell in two years and take that windfall? You know, the, there's not a lot of incentive for a developer then to put their heart, heart and soul into doing it well. And likewise, um, as everybody else looks around it, it can quickly undermine. So these issues of who will be the delivery agent, how will that land, and that value capture occur and who will hold it long run are integral to, to an effective inclusionary zoning system. And when those are, are not the settings that are put in place from the beginning, it, it won't be successful. And it'll be either stall development as we've seen in many of the Bay Area cities for many reasons, not just the inclusionary zoning, um, uh, but it also undermines the programs that people just don't want to participate and go someplace where it's easier. And so I think the other side that is important that came in with that is what are those ways that you make it easier for the developers to do this and that you can ensure that pipeline is not only there, but it's moving and there's something flowing through it. It's not that you fill the pipeline and it's empty. That doesn't serve anyone well. So as you think about who would hold the, the land, who is paying the cost? Because there is a, a cost, whether you call it a tax, whether you call it a value capture, 
that there's value that's created and held somewhere. And it's very important that who holds that value is well thought through. Community land trusts, community housing providers, we think those in that not-for-profit sector are well placed uh, to do that alongside councils and, and government. Other comments or questions? I think you're going to set aside the special housing area experience from the Europe to Japan experience because the special housing area was sort of a, um, it wasn't the full print that was applied through that process. I mean, the Europe to Japan stuff that we put up um, did have all the retention mechanisms in there, the whole idea. It was at the time that when all that rezoning was occurring through the future urban area as well as the brownfield, so there was that connection with rezoning. I mean, it wasn't directly related to the value uplift, but the idea was there. Um, and we looked at that criteria about needing to have those potential mechanisms in place for the long term. I know you've yeah. taken the point. That's, yeah, I was and talking about special housing. Well, the special areas. housing areas, of course, was, as I told, talked about, was only an interim solution to put part of the plan in place before it was fully settled. And because the plan wasn't fully settled, of course, all the tools couldn't have to go with it. So, yes, it was a sort of a botched job. But you could say it's a step along the way, you learn a lot from it um, out of that process. And um, it does tell you, of course, yeah, the, the importance of having a, that, that, um, um, that, that full suite of tools to go with it, definitely. Um, uh, the whole retention thing is a whole new thing for, for the Kiwi uh, property sector. Um, you know, deep restricted, some sort of, you know, restriction on, on sale, all the rest of it. Um, but it's not uncommon. Um, you look across the UK now, um, and I can't what the numbers figures this Trisha probably knows this, but between, I think 60 70 percent of their, their social housing now comes through the planning system, through their um, their version of inclusionary zoning. I mean, I guess the main point I would come back to is that, um, um, uh, you know, the affordable housing, not down the social end, but the sort of, you know, that middle sector, it's always had some sort of incentive or some sort of subsidy from somewhere to help it get through the process. Um, if we go back to the 30s and 50s, you know, there's different techniques put in place to help that at the moment. Um, now we've shifted to this whole idea of, well, we can create an efficient market that will sort out the problems. I think what we're running into now is the limitations that are sort of efficient markets of approach. Um, and what you actually do there, you do need some positive support in there for that sort of um, social housing, affordable housing sector to come through. Um, and, and I think that goes to me uh, hand in hand with this idea of creating an efficient market. You're going to get down that way. And actually, the tools that go along with an efficient market need to be there to make it work, just as we see in other areas of, of the economy. Um, so, I mean, yeah, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, yeah, the danger is doing half fight, I guess, um, and the good part of that today. Um, I think the other danger is, yeah, there's always a different solution just around the corner, which is a better solution or a bigger solution, too. So, I think you're going to watch that one, too. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Kira, just having a little walk line here with Sharon Beale. Um, any other Kira, any other questions or comments? We'll wrap up pretty shortly, I suspect. Kira, well, um, I'll, I'll make a final comment. You know, I, I, I just want to reflect really briefly on speaking with the planning committee at Auckland Council a few weeks ago, and really the question that came out of the questions that I was asked was really around that question of. Um, okay, so we can we can look at our planning system as something that's creating a lot of value, um, and we're not capturing that publicly very well at the moment. Um, so yeah, there's an opportunity there. But then the key question that came through probably before, maybe in the quiet councillors, and the questioning was how do we retain it? Uh, so how do we turn it as as you know a number of the speakers today talked about? How do we actually turn that from being something that ends up being given away or um, or not, not really utilised for public purposes, how do we change it from something that's actually retained for public good in perpetuity? Um, and I guess uh, that's one of the thing, key things that inclusionary zoning spins around, which is if you can get that mechanism right so that you're really retaining that value in perpetuity, uh, I think that's one of the things that A, unlocks the hearts and minds of elected members, um, but also obviously unlocks the mechanism itself to make it come. So, um, 
Kia ora and, and thanks. Uh, I just want to actually say thanks to Chris uh, from Community Housing Aotearoa, Deputy uh, Chief Executive, for um, really <laughs> helping us come together a great deal. And thank you all for uh, coming in, and Tanya, thanks for the fact that you put together, and to all of our speakers. Uh, kia ora, thanks so much. And to you for coming along, please stay for a mingle, cup of tea, uh, and I'm sure there's still a bit of kai out there.